But anyhow, <laughs> back to Common Core. Uh, I, I passed a bill this year, Senate Bill 864, that was an attempt that, candidly, I would have liked to see legislation passed that extracted Florida completely from the whole Common Core process. But that wasn't, that wasn't a political reality. It just was not going to happen. Um, so I said, all right, I am weary of citizens being upset over the curriculum content, whether it be world history, where chapter 10 in one of the world history books that I personally read myself, in my opinion, it, that chapter could be lifted out and taken down to the local mosque and used in Muslim 101 as an orientation uh, course. There are some absolutely embarrassing reading assignments that are being given in literature classes that candidly have no place in what I would consider a decent society and they sure enough don't belong in a high school classroom. Shouldn't have been published in the first place. Yes ma'am, that's right. And some of the bizarre methods that are being taught for solving mathematic problems are just that. They're bizarre methods and, and they make no sense at all to anybody that has a background in math. And I made it through the second quarter of calculus in college. Thank you very much. I did have a little bit of that. I also had organic chemistry and organic chemistry and physics and all that other things that you have to have to get into dental school. But um, the, 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 the bizarre mathematics stuff is just over the top and, and it's a waste of time, I think. So I think there's a lot of work yet to be done. So what can we do in the short term? I said, let's pass the bill that says every county school board must set up a formal appeal process. And let me, let me back, back up a little bit and give you some history too. For years, I guess forever, I don't know how many years, but for as long as I've known about, the State Board of Education sets the standards, and that group of standards is called Sunshine State Standards. That's quite a novel term, you know, <laughs> in Florida. That's what it means. Yes, ma'am. You wouldn't call it the peach standard. <laughs> uh, they may be peachy, but that's okay. Um, so then the, the Department of Education hires curriculum experts, so-called, to evaluate and review any number of suggested curriculum materials, instructional materials, whether they be textbooks, whether they be DVDs, whether they be pamphlets, or whatever they may be, that the publishers want to sell to the school system. This review panel uh, peruses and hopefully reads, and yet I wonder, but they publish then a list of materials that they have ascertained um, meet the Sunshine State standards. If the student masters the material in that instructional material, they will have met the instructional needs. Um, the book is about that thick of the different titles for all K through 12 and all the different uh, uh, subject matter. And so um, the, the county school boards choose from that list the materials they want to use in their county and move them into the classroom and there they go. So I wanted the school board to be held accountable. They're the ones that run for election. The, the State Department of Education never runs for election. The Ed Education Commissioner doesn't run for election. That, that position's an appointed position. So I wanted some accountability to the voters. So we said, all right, you, the school board, must establish a formal review process so that any concerned citizen or parent who objects to your adoption of a particular instructional material can file an objection within 30 days after you have selected it. And then at the end of that 30 day filing period, you have 30 days as a school board in which to hold a noticed public hearing. And to all of those citizens who have filed an objection, you must provide them with written notification at least seven days in advance of the hearing. And then 
after the hearing is concluded, the school board makes a decision. Are they going to sustain their original choice or are they going to choose another uh, instructional material? And if they sustain the original choice, then it's turned for the voters to let them know at the next ballot time whether they approve of their selection or not. It's just that simple. And uh, that's the way it is. Now, one other thing too, to avoid everything getting hung up in court and costing the school boards and the public and everybody else a whole bunch of money, I said, at, when that school board makes that decision at the end of the appeal process, that's it. You have no recourse in a court uh, just You wait, some lawyer will try it out on any of it. Not me. But that's, that's the best I could do this year to try to make sure that citizen objections are heard at least and hopefully acted upon. Yes, ma'am. Uh, that sounds good, but I think the, the thing I see that might be an issue there is 30 days. Mm -hmm. It's the 30 days from the time they've selected it. The books don't get in the hands of the parents until well after the decision is made, the purchase has been made, so they don't see what the what is in that textbook until it's way too late to do anything right. about it. That's right. So you. we have to have dedicated people that are yeah. in voters with kids that are going to look at these books prior within that 30 days, and I'm not sure we have that. Well. My suggestion is for those concerned citizens to go to the school board office and say, we want to know the list of books that you are considering. Mm -hmm. And we want to know the publishers, and then you go to the publisher's website and look up that instructional material on their website and peruse it there. You're absolutely correct. Get an early start in the process, because if you wait for that 30-day window, you're probably gonna be sorry that you waited that long. And you know, realistically, why not try to get influence with the school board when they make their original selection? That's true, but, um, I, but from a parent's point of view, I have a, a, I don't have a kid in school right now, of course, mm -hmm. my kids, but um, you, you've got a kid going into seventh grade or something, you haven't looked at their, they haven't had a per se history book before or whatever, and you're not gonna look at those books until they bring that book home for the first time. You're right? absolutely right, and, and sadly, and so, many of them don't even look at it then. It's only when they're the third so, or fourth week in school when the student says, hey, Dad, let me read this to you. <laughs> you're so my, my question is, so maybe at this point they can't do anything about this book that's being used for that school year. Is there a period of time when that school year runs around again to that point where they start to look at textbooks? Or do they have to reselect that book? Yeah, they're on so the five-year cycle. So that if you have, it, have voters that object to that book, they have another 30-day window in order right. to get rid of it? Right, they're on a five-year cycle. I think for all the instructional materials, but don't take that to the back yet. Um, but I do so know they that can't many, look, of them, they many of them are five-year cycles. But here's, here's the reality also, Jan, and, and you, your, your point is spot on. The bill we pass this year is step one. If we, if we see the need for an extended period of time, then I'll be happy to file the bill to extend that period of time to more than the 30 days. You know? But this is, you, you learn, and I'll always remember the guy that, that verbally taught it to me. It was Fred Brummer from Apopka. Uh, Fred was, was, he was a curmudgeon is the easiest way to, um, to explain Fred. He's just a delightful guy once you get to know it, but crusty, oh my goodness. And he had a bill that, that he was sponsoring that had to do with the positions that were misbehaving, and, and the, the punishment was nothing more than just a little flip on the finger, it wasn't even a slap on the hand. And I called him, I said, Fred, you're crazy. I said, if you want this thing to mean something, put some teeth in it, you know? He said, yeah, coming from a dentist, I would expect it. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, Alan, he says, let me share with you something that I've learned in my years ahead of you in the legislature. And he wasn't trying to be condescending at all. He said, if you go home with two or three slices of that loaf of bread, you're better off than you were when you got here with no, no bread at all. And he says, next year, you can come back and get two or three more slices. And sooner or later, you'll have a whole loaf of bread. And so I, I took that to the bank. And and that's one of the things we did with this. Well, that's the methodology the they use to get the policies in place with us today. You're right. Is the two slices of bread, and then we don't follow it up, and then they get the fourth and fifth. 
Is that and we've got rules of the young. group of parents who have uh, had that list and can read it before it even gets to the school board? Oh, yeah, they can read it. I mean, it's, it's public record. The, the problem is many too few parents care. are involved. Care. Yeah, you know, they care more about going to work or, unfortunately, I know it just breaks my heart to know the obscene number of students whose parents are passed out from some dumb drug mm -hmm. or drunk all the time or whatever. It, it is, it, the, the, the war stories um, of what I consider underprivileged students by the fact, I mean, that some of the parents can be wealthy, but they're just drugged out all the time. It, it's, it's atrocious. Here's, here's another real big part of this that was put in by one of the House members from, uh, from South Florida. This act does not limit or remove the responsibility of each school district to include in its curriculum the required instructions specified in Statute 1003.42, including but not limited to the following, the history of the United States, the history of the Holocaust, the history of African Americans, the study of Hispanic contributions to the United States, the study of women's contributions to the United States, the nature and importance of free enterprise to the United States economy, patriotism, the events surrounding the terrorist attacks occurring on September 11, 2001, and the impact of those events on the nation, the elementary principles of agriculture, and kindness to animals. So that's what we're telling the school systems they got to teach, uh, in addition to other things. Yes, ma'am, that's a start. Okay, the golden rule, pardon me? Oh. <laughs> Courtesy of the Golden Rule. Yeah. Um, honestly, you know what I do. It begins in the home. And and it's it's so sad that you know, I, I was absolutely astounded to learn this year, I didn't know it until this year during session, that American history is taught in Florida middle schools from early American history through eighteen sixty four. Nothing after the Civil War. In high school, 1865 to the present. Now, my objections to that are many, but I'm, I'll bring one to you. The last paragraph of the Declaration of Independence, when those brave men penned, we hereby pledge our sacred honor, our fortunes, and our lives, maybe not in that order, but anyhow, those three things, that's going to mean one thing to a middle school kid, but it's very likely going to mean another thing to a high school kid. And I think it's most unfortunate, to be very kind, um, that, that they've chosen to teach it that way. To break it up. Yes, ma'am. And, you know, that's one of the reasons that we're in the mess that we're in today. Too few people even know what the three branches of government are. 85% of college grads cannot name the three levels of government in this country. I don't doubt it. Civics yeah. are just not. It's, it, we are in a, a terrible, terrible shape. But not all is hopeless. <laughs> there are multiple groups. One of the things that, that, that I just returned with Larry Metz, Larry, myself, and 10 other uh, members of the House were in Indianapolis last Thursday all day and half day Friday. And the reality is some of us wound up staying all day Friday because we couldn't get out of town <laughs> due to airline malfunction, but nevertheless. Uh, the Mount Vernon Assembly first met in December of last year in the George Washington Presidential Library on the Washington State there in Mount Vernon. And the purpose of that group, it was it was about, had about 100 legislators there in Virginia. We are striving to bring enough states on board to petition Congress to convene a convention of the states for the purpose of crafting amendments to the United States Constitution. There are several uh, branches, if you will, or fragments of, of this movement toward uh, you know, bringing, bringing in the runaway federal government. And 
And, and so how is it going to finally shake out? We don't know. Literally, this body that, that we've formed, we, we've changed the name of it in Indianapolis last week. We're no longer called the Mount Vernon Assembly. We're called the Assembly of State Legislatures. And if you want to, if you want to go on Google, you can just Google the Assembly of State Legislatures org, and you can come up with a real nice is, web page there. Is that based on Levin's book? Uh, about the ability I would say it's very compatible. Yeah. It's very compatible with yeah. Levin's book. Yeah, I have that book. Okay. But anyhow, we are, we are, we have now formed the committees, and we have broken those down into subcommittees to try to, to lay the preliminary groundwork so that when the convention is convened, instead of them taking several months to work out their rules, work out their procedures, work out various other uh, important but somewhat trivial things, we can take our work product to them and say, here, delegates, is a point of beginning for you. Supply. Take this, consider it, amend it in whatever way, because historically, every legislative body, whether it be the Florida legislature, or the, even more fine than that, the Florida House adopts their rules, the Florida Senate adopts their rules, the, and fill in the blank for the state, all around Congress, the House adopts their rules. So the Convention of States will be no different than that. They will be the only ones to adopt their rules. Um, but, but at least we'll have a work product there for them. So we're trying that. Um, That's great. To your point about the Golden Rule, I happen to know a gentleman named Bob Williamson lives up in North Florida, a little town called Greenville. It's about 40 miles east of Tallahassee. Bob's a very wealthy man who is deeply, deeply concerned about the, the, the track that America is on, and he is leading what he hopes becomes a worldwide movement, but certainly a national movement, to return America to her biblical roots. And anybody who would deny that this nation, this nation was established on biblical principles has not read American history. They, they don't know what they're talking about. And, and you know, why do you think America flourished and became the shining star that she was? It was because of the foundation upon which she was built and the, the, the hearts of the people that carried it on. And why do you think we're in the predicament we're in today? Because of the hearts of the people. And until the pastors in the churches step up to the plate and start shouldering their responsibility to to, well, yeah, they got to grow back on this, right? To inform their parishioners, uh, this idea of separation of church and state is a bunch of bunk. And um, that's what we really need to do. It doesn't make any difference what country it is. If people's hearts are not right, it's going to be corrupt. And, and we're, we're in a bad place. Well, we we so. Yes, sir. Um, Let me just thank this way. Let me, I'm, I'm drawing a blank. Um, but they'll have, if, if it's not up and running, it will be up and running pretty shortly. His uh, name is? His name is Bob Williamson. I haven't visited the Honey Lake Plantation website uh, lately, but Bob owns Honey Lake Plantation Resort and Spa. It's about close to 5,000 acres up there in North Florida. Uh, Bob, has a, Bob has a very interesting history. His autobiography, the title of it is Miracle on Lucky Street. Lucky is spelled L-U-C-K-I-E. Let me warn you, the first 50 chapters of that book are very, very difficult reading. It is the most wicked, evil, vile lifestyle that anybody could imagine. He warns you about it at the very front page. When you open the cover, there the book says, warning, big, bold, black print. What you're about to read it's true, raw, and uncensored. And it's a very difficult read, but it has a very nice ending. Mm -hmm. And no truer words have ever been printed in a book than those. What was the book's name now? Miracle on Lucky Street. L-U-C-K-I-E. The author is? Bob Williamson. You can download it on your uh, iPad or your, uh, what do they call them, the Kindle machine. Mm -hmm. 
that sort of thing? Or well, the liberals it? should love that first part, but it's because of the ending that they won't have anything yeah. to do with it. Well, I'll tell you my personal experience. I, I heard Bob tell his life story at a meeting, and he did it all in about 20 minutes. It wasn't one of these long-winded things like I am today. And, and uh, as soon as he finished, I had seen the books on display when I came in. I made a beeline to the book, and I grabbed one and took it back, and I said, here, did you autograph this for me? And he did, and, uh, and, and I, knowing what the end of the story was like, the first half was so bad, I laid it down a couple of times, and I, my thought was, I don't have to read this guy. But then later on, I'd go back and pick it up, not because I enjoyed the film, but because I wanted to see just what he had gone through. Uh, Sounds uh, like Happy, 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 which is Phil Robertson with Duck Commander. Yes, ma'am. His first um, few years. I haven't time. read Phil's story, but I know enough about it to know that he, he uh, was not what you call him, yeah. a, a, a front row Baptist. <laughs> well, he is now, but yeah, he was yeah. not in those early years. All right, folks, I, uh, I, would, I would say <coughs> just proudly, to forget the term unashamedly, I, I want to say proudly, we as Republicans have a great, great story. One of the highlights of my year thus far has been uh, a week ago this past Friday night being in Ocala and hearing Colonel Allen West speak. And... Again, American history being taught in the schools is so deficient. But the Republican Party was started in Jackson, Michigan, after the Kansas-Nebraska Act was passed, giving one slaves and one free. And the people in Jackson, Michigan said, we've had enough of this slavery stuff. We've got to begin to stop it. And yet, today, most of the black people in this country vote Democratic. The civil rights legislation that was proposed in Congress when Lyndon Johnson was the majority leader in the Senate, he made sure that those bills went to committees that were controlled by Southern Democrats from Alabama and Mississippi, and they didn't stand a snowball's chance of ever being heard. And then when, when they finally Republicans browbeat them into submission and pass the Civil Rights Act. And if what I learned this last summer, it just absolutely blew my mind to learn I, because I've often wondered why do so many black people vote for the Democrats with the Democratic Party history? I knew growing up down here in the South what it was like, you know? And the Democrats rule with an iron fist. If you don't believe it, there's another book, Devil in the Grove. Lake County Sheriff. Yeah. Well, Jared uh, brought David Martin's uh, history, yeah. and I did not know until that that it was the Ku Klux Klan was a Democratic, get oh, rid yeah. of the Republicans. Yeah. And after the Civil War, they sure. all fought for Republicans. When, when Kennedy was running against Nixon in 1960, Martin Luther King had been arrested in Georgia, tried and convicted, and sentenced. To, I believe it was two years of hard labor. And when John Kennedy heard that, or read about it, whatever, when he became informed, he picked up the phone and called Dr. King's wife and introduced himself and said, if there's anything I can do to help you, let me know. Richard Nixon never picked up the phone. Now, Dr. King and his father were both pastors of large churches at that time. Historically, the black community had always voted with the Republicans, and they were prepared to endorse Nixon. That one phone call flipped the whole election. And as they say, the rest is history. What a dismal, dismal occurrence. One phone call, um, and you just never can tell how many lives it's going to affect. And, and it's so sad that, uh, that we have the situation that we do today. But people like yourselves, standing up, proudly proclaiming the truth, will win in the end, I do believe. The media, unfortunately, are in bed with the liberals, or I should say perhaps they're leading the liberals even. And, and they are greatly responsible for the demise of our country. They're not telling both sides of the story, much no. less telling the truth. 
and, and they would have Floridians believe that Rick Scott is a crook and he's this and that and the other and 49 other things, all of which are negative, and that his opponent, whose name I rarely ever use, uh, is, is the great on the white savior on the steed, you know? And instead, he's riding a dad burnt jackass. Mm. He ain't no white steed. <laughs> and I know from my first two years being in the legislature when Jeb Bush was the governor, we had real leadership when he was our governor. Mm -hmm. And we've had outstanding leadership these last three years. Rick Scott ran told everybody in Florida, if you'll give me seven years, I will create 700,000 jobs in the private sector in this state within seven years. It's been roughly three and a half years and there's already been more than 600,400 jobs created in this state in the private sector in that three year time period. Rick Scott is a conscientious, hardworking man. He will return your phone calls he will give you a straight answer. When you go in to visit with him in his office, he's sitting there with a pad and a pen himself, taking his own notes. He doesn't depend on some staffer over here in the corner. And when you finish the appointment, he will recap his notes. And when you leave there, you know what's expected of you, what's expected of him, what the timeline is, and how you're going to measure success. And he'll back you up all the way. Now, let's talk about another side of him. He just signed a $77 billion budget. He is the governor of the state of Florida, and he calls individual members that he knows are familiar with the different appropriations for as little as $200,000. He called Marlene O'Toole and she had an appropriation that he knew that she, that was one of her favorites. He says, tell me more about this because right now it's on the chopping block. <laughs> I mean, he's, he's not there to fulfill his own ego. He's there to be a responsible steward for the tax dollars of the people of this state. And we absolutely, as a party, must go forward, tell his message anybody and everybody that is breathing, whether they sit still or not. <laughs> um, I beg you folks, we do not want to be thrown in on the liberal pile at all. And that's exactly where we'll be if, if Rick doesn't win. We've got to bring Governor Scott back. And uh, out of everything I've said today, that is my plea to you. Please, please help us make sure that he comes back as our governor. Thank you. I've talked to you. Thank you very much. All right. I'm going to head back across the county unless anybody's got any last.